Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this uh, talk before we start. Uh, uh, I would like to tell you that uh, AIDA and also AI for Media and Elise, that's two ICT48 projects, flag, AI flagship projects uh, funded by the European Union. They organize the AI Melondology or Futurology, if you want to call it symposium. It's a hybrid event that's going to take place uh, here in Thessaloniki in Greece in September, the 23rd of September. And it's going to be also accessed worldwide. It's informal discussions about the future of AI. So if you have ideas on very interesting topics like the one that you're going to see, you are welcome to send proposals to organize uh, uh, panel discussions, and if you can, you can visit us here in Thessaloniki and participate in the event, or you can join it remotely. So uh, that was an announcement, and now we start the the main business of the meeting today, which is um, a very interesting topic by Professor Deride from uh, Catholic University of Leuven. He's very well known. AI scientist, and he's going to talk about a very important topic, which is um, neurosymbolic computing. Luke? Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks for uh, the kind invitation and the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about neurosymbolic AI, and I'm going to connect it to this other field that's known as statistical relational AI. Uh, a joint work with a lot of my uh, postdocs and um, uh, like Robin, Angelica, Giuseppe, Sebastian, Thomas, and uh, Thomas, of course. Uh, this is a slide you probably have seen a number of times that you know learning and reasoning are both needed. And people typically refer to the book by Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman. Uh, thinking fast and slow. He talks about two different uh, systems. System one, which is about thinking fast. It uh, can do things like two plus two is four. You directly recognize also people that are in a room. You don't really have to think about that. It's going so fast. Uh, then there is system two, which is about uh, more complex um, problem solving, like if you plan a trip, uh, if you uh, solve a mathematical exercise, if you prove something, that's the kind of uh, process that you will go through, typically in multiple steps, uh, employing knowledge and kind of more uh, the reasoning kind of thing. Now, while system one, system two has its origins in cognitive science, it's uh, been taken over uh, within AI and there's different uh, terms and terminology that's being used uh, in these um, uh, different fields. People in machine learning talk about data versus knowledge driven. In the old days, people were talking about symbolic versus sub symbolic one. Uh, people like Hector Gaffner talk about solvers versus learners. So there is different uh, terminology uh, around that is actually referring to, well, pretty much connected uh, issues. Um, there's also a lot of work uh, that's trying to integrate the two. And I guess everybody today is, is uh, feeling that uh, the quest for integrated learning and reasoning systems is like uh, the next big question. It's gonna be the next wave uh, of AI. What people uh, don't agree about, and there you have different camps is like where the emphasis should be. Like uh, people from the uh, neural network community like uh, Lacoon and Benjo say, well, the neural networks are gonna solve everything. Whereas other people are saying, well, you also need to look at these, these other kind of systems. Uh, so while everybody agrees that this is the problem, people don't really agree on, on the solution. Uh, I think the problem is very important for the real life. I mean, this is the kind of questions that you typically get if you try to pass your driver's license. Uh, you get like these images and then there is like this question um, about the traffic rules, like where you are allowed to go or, or what is, is allowed to happen. And there's different aspects that uh, needs to be taken into account here. First of all, you have to recognize the entities, say the cars, the pedestrians, the cyclists, the traffic signs uh, and the road signs. Um, and so you have to, to recognize all of that, and that's like a perception task. On the other hand, you also have to take into account the rules of traffic in order to produce the right kind of answer. And so here you have like typically the system one and system two that really has to be 
uh, combined to uh, provide the relevant uh, kind of answers. And of course, if we have uh, to be able to do this kind of reasoning, you would also expect that uh, self-driving cars are able to do exactly the same. And you're not gonna train this um, by end-to-end -end showing um, zillions of, of images to uh, about traffic uh, to a neural network. Uh, you typically want it to also be able to take into account uh, the learned, um, um, the kind of knowledge about traffic rules, which are described everywhere. Um, if you look at the history of AI, then there is like this paradigm for thinking fast, and there's been amazing progress uh, in uh, neural networks, and it's amazingly uh, effective, and it's probably the main paradigm for machine learning uh, today, uh, and that's thinking fast, but you also have uh, a lot of progress in reasoning, uh, in particular in logic and probability, which are the two traditional paradigms within AI, uh, to support uh, reasoning and to, to, um, to think slowly. Um, their integration of probabilistic and logical methods like probabilistic graphical models and, and more logical reasoning uh, has been uh, studied in uh, a number of domains like star AI, standing for statistical relational AI and also probabilistic logic uh, programming. And um, the quest now is not to just do one or the other, not reasoning or learning, but really to combine everything together. And there's a nice book out there uh, by Pedro Domingos, who talks about the master algorithm and the quest for integrating the five different schools uh, in machine learning. Uh, there's two more, like there is the analogizers and there's the evolutionaries. But basically what I'm gonna talk about is really integrating logic, probability and neural networks in a common framework as to tackle learning and reasoning at uh, the same time. Uh, if you look at the state of the art in neurosymbolic computation, well, what neurosymbolic computation is trying to do, it's actually combining the logic with uh, the neural networks. And uh, my key message, uh, my first key message for today will be that uh, this neurosymbolic field uh, has uh, a lot in common with uh, this logic and probability field like star AI, uh, in the sense that a lot of uh, the same kind of issues uh, arise in star AI and in the neurosymbolic, and that therefore similar solutions uh, apply. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, there is a survey paper at uh, Ichikai a couple of years ago, and there's also like a follow on uh, at archive that's currently uh, under submission uh, for a journal. Uh, a warning, this talk may not cover all the possible views of neurosymbolic. I mean, people sometimes refer to words as symbols, and that's not uh, the kind of neurosymbolic that uh, I'm, I'm uh, talking about. I'm really talking about this reasoning and this, this logical issues uh, connected to that. Now, if you look at uh, the state of the art in neurosymbolic, then what you will notice is that most of the neurosymbolic approaches, they kind of inject the logic they inject the knowledge into the neural networks and then assume that the neural networks will do all the rest. And uh, after training, the logic disappears and everything is uh, kind of delegated to the neural network. Now, the down downside of this is that this relies only on one of the two sides uh, of, of this same coin. And so that the power of reasoning, the power of explanation, and the power of trust is at least partly lost in this kind of approach. And that's also why I propose a different approach. Rather than saying like one of the two schools, like the reasoning and um, the, 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 um, the neural networks, um, rather than reducing one to the other, I, I propose a different approach where you really integrate them. And if you integrate uh, two paradigms, you basically want that the originals uh, can be reconstructed as special cases of the integrated framework. And um, um, if you apply that to neurosymbolic, well, you basically want to develop neurosymbolic approaches where you have logic on the one hand as a special case, and also where you have neural network as a special case, or at least the abilities that um, both of them have. And uh, that's going to be uh, the second part of the talk. I'm going to uh, illustrate it with uh, our deep problem system, uh, which is uh, actually integrating uh, probabilistic logics with uh, neural networks, and which has exactly uh, this kind of uh, property. But let me first go from uh, probabilistic logics 
uh, to neurosymbolic. And uh, that's the field of uh, Styri where I'm gonna start from. Um, and yeah, that I've been active in, in about for about 20 years. And uh, when I say there is uh, similar problems and similar solutions, then uh, we've analyzed the state of the art in Styri and in neurosymbolic. And we've actually come up with about seven dimensions along which you can classify different neurosymbolic and different star AI uh, approaches. And um, the basic uh, distinction is actually quite simple because it already starts in logic. It then carries over to like probabilistic graphical models and it carries over to neurosymbolic. It's always the same kind of issue, the same kind of design that is happening. So I'm gonna start with logic then gonna go to Bayesian networks and then gonna go to neurosymbolic and showing you similar issues. Here you see a very simple, tiny little logical theory. It's a tiny prologue program. And uh, what you see in the rectangle is that there are true facts, like uh, there is a burglary, there is an earthquake and both Mary and John, they hear the alarm. What you then see is also like uh, certain rules for instance, that Mary will call if she hears the alarm and um, yeah, the alarm goes off basically. So, so that's what this rule is saying. You can really read it as a kind of if then rule. So if the alarm goes off and Mary hears it, she will call you. That's basically the meaning of that rule. Once you have rules like that, uh, you can actually build proofs with it in order to see whether something holds or whether something is a logical consequence of uh, that theory, you ask queries. And here you can ask the query, will Mary call? And you build proofs, I mean, to uh, prove that Mary will call, you use this rule that I just show and said, well, in order to prove that, I need to show that there is an alarm and that Mary, Mary heard the alarm. And then you apply the next rule, like there is alarm, there's uh, one rule that says the alarm goes off if there is an earthquake, and that gives us the left branch. There is the other rule that says there will be an alarm if there's a burglary, and that's kind of giving us the right branch. And so you continue like proving until, well, there's nothing left to prove, and that's like the leaves of this tree. And so here you have like two possible proofs showing that Mary indeed calls. There's also this other perspective. I mean, so this is like a proof theoretic perspective. You prove things with the rules. And there's also the model theoretic perspective. I mean, the model theoretic is very much like you have in SAT solvers. I mean, SAT solvers are like um, very prominent in computer science because they're used for uh, in a lot of, of, of theory and in, in a lot of practical systems. And here you can also read these rules as kind of constraints. Like the first rule, uh, says again the same thing. Well, okay, Mary will call if and only if you know these two things are true. And then you can look if I have these as constraint, what are possible worlds that make this um, constraints true or that satisfy these constraints? And that is the model theoretic uh, perspective. On the right hand, you see indeed um, this possible world, which is a model for that theory, which satisfies these constraints, because whenever the condition part of the rule is true, also the, con the, the other, other side is also true, right? So like the first rule, for instance, is satisfied because, okay, it's satisfied because um, Mary hears the alarm, it's not in that possible world, and so it's supposed to be false. And of course, the conjunction is false, if one of the conditions is, is, is not in there, right? You can also see that, um, for instance, the last rule um, is, is kind of satisfied here because alarm uh, occurs and also burglary occurs. So the left and the right hand are in, in a kind of logical balance, uh, so to say. Now, okay, this is logic. And so you might say, well, why should we care? Well, you should care because um, in star and in probabilistic logics and in Bayesian networks, uh, very similar things occur. Uh, on the left hand, you see like uh, Judea Pearls, classical Bayesian network, uh, very well known from the books by Russell and Norvig, um, which is kind of a directed graphical model. On the right hand, you see, um, yeah, this kind of Markov logic, 
uh, where indeed you also specify constraints and you see that both on the left and the right hand side, you know, there is numbers appearing and they will tell us something about the strengths of the constraint or they will tell us something about uh, the probability with which the um, the things are actually holding us. So you also have a, a directed and the kind of undirected version, the directed being the prologue version in a sense, the proof theoretic perspective, the undirected being the constrained perspective, the, the model uh, theoretic uh, perspective. Now, if you look at um, uh, neurosymbolic systems, then again, you see exactly the same kind of phenomenon. You have on the one hand um, systems that use these uh, logic as a kind of neural program to encode certain things. And on the other hand, you see uh, also that the logic is being used as constraints. And whenever the constraints are violated, there's some kind of loss uh, that is triggered. And, and so logic is used as a regularizer in a sense. And that is um, very much what you also see uh, in these uh, systems. If you go to one of the earliest, um, probably the earliest kind of neurosymbolic approach, uh, K-Ban by uh, Taul and Chavlik, uh, almost 30 years old, uh, what they were doing, they were looking at the kind of rules that I was just showing. Uh, and you see an example here on the left-hand side. Uh, this is the same kind of rules as we had in the alarm example. And then they would turn that into a kind of neural network. The way in which they would do that is like uh, uh, apply certain rewrites to that um, uh, set of rules and the rules would be turned into a kind of possible end or tree, a kind of which is closely connected to the proof trees that we've seen in a sense. And so you would end up with the structure that you have on the right. You have, and that structure would be given uh, to the neural network. That would be like the starting structure of the neural network. And then of course, they would play the typical tricks that people do with neural networks. They would add some, um, you know, hidden extra nodes like the gray one, maybe they would add connections and then they would start training. Um, and so that, that's the, the kind of logic as a neural program, which is still very much in use today in this neurosymbolic uh, systems. Um, um, systems where this is, for instance, used is the lifted relational neural networks by uh, the group around Andre Kuzelka in, in Prague, which is doing exactly this, but with much richer language. Uh, he's also taking like, you know, these programs, turn them into proofs, turn the proofs into neural networks, and then uh, training on. Uh, there's a very fancy and very inspiring system called the Neural Tier Improver by uh, uh, Sebastian Riedel and, and Tim Rock Tuchel. Uh, where they basically use this kind of rules, like the rules on, on the top left, where you have father of, parent of, grandfather of, uh, being defined in, in logic, uh, in, in a kind of prologue notation. And then uh, they would build proof trees. Um, the fancy thing, and, and the really cool thing about this, is that um, in logic, well, um, you either have a, a perfect match uh, with grandfather of, for instance, grandfather of will only match with grandfather of, but they have adapted their NTP to uh, also work um, with what they called soft unification and uh, soft matching in a sense. And so if uh, their knowledge base would contain variants like grandfather of and grandpa of, then they would match uh, and would still be able to build the, uh, the kind of proof tree. It's just not a logical proof tree that would return true. It would return a kind of value that indicate how good the matches are amongst uh, the proof building. And that's a, a very uh, interesting system that is being used uh, also in, in uh, knowledge base, um, to construct knowledge bases and, and, and to learn about that. Now, in both of these approaches, you see that the logic is encoded in the network. And um, you know once uh, you've trained, I mean, the logic has disappeared. And um, yeah, it, it's no longer possible to, to reason really in the logical way as you would be able to do with, with the pure logic. And that's kind of, of, of uh, a downside. Uh, if you look at the other approach, uh, where you have logic as the kind of regularizer, um, I can illustrate that with a very interesting and very clean uh, version of um, the semantic loss, as it's called. It's uh, by the group of uh, Heath Vandenbroek at uh, UCLA. 
And uh, the way that he illustrates it is like uh, on a tiny little example where you have to do multi-class classification. And so there are three classes, one, two, and three. And you could imagine that for particular green uh, inputs, you've got like these values at the outputs, uh, 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0 0.9. And that's kind of undesirable because if it's like multi-class classification, you want only one of the outputs to fire in a sense. Um, now, the insight that they had uh, is essentially that, um, well, you can uh, also specify constraints on the possible outputs and you can use uh, propositional logic, you know, the rules that people are using in uh, satisfiability uh, to specify that on the left hand, on the right hand side, what you see is um, the, the logical constraint saying that exactly one of the outputs should be uh, true and uh, not more in a sense. Uh, the other thing is that they turn that into a kind of probabilistic interpretation. So rather than saying yes, no, the constraint is satisfied, they look at the probability that the constraint is satisfied, and you can map that into this kind of um, number. Uh, it's very easy to see that it's just a little bit of math, and uh, that is then used as a kind of semantic loss, a kind of penalty. Uh, to regularize uh, the neural network. And so what they do is like, I mean, they turn that into uh, this log of this, this uh, summed probability and, and they use that as a kind of regularizer uh, to punish the neural network if it doesn't satisfy uh, these uh, constraints. And, and that's very close in spirit to the probabilistic uh, logics because they give a probabilistic interpretation to all of this. And again, you'll see that um, this uh, kind of phenomenon where you specify logic and uh, you try to push that into your network and you try to use it as a kind of regularizer, that this is um, a pretty common. I mean, uh, if you look at the famous logic tensor networks by uh, Serafini and Garcia, it's exactly uh, what they are doing. It's just that they're not using a probabilistic logic, but a kind of fuzzy logic, a soft logic. And again, they would encode these constraints uh, in their network. Semantic based regularization from the Siena group around Marco Gori and uh, Diligenti is, is like, uh, again, something uh, that is, is, is very similar. But again, what you see is that the logic is like kept outside the neural network. You know, it's used to regularize. Once uh, the network is trained, it's lost, and you cannot reason logically anymore. And that's what I mean with uh, the tradition in this field is really to push down the logic in the neural network, and then um, you can't really do all the tricks you wanted to do with, with logic in a sense. And, and that's not the kind of approach that, that I um, uh, pursue. Um, there's another dimension. I mean, I was talking about seven dimensions that are shared between star AI and neurosymbolic systems. And another dimension is like the meaning of the numbers. And uh, there are at least three possible uh, choices you can make. Uh, in the first approach, you have like just logic that's true and false or one and zero. Then you can give it a probabilistic interpretation. And what you see is that most systems are actually using the fuzzy interpretation. Um, the downside with the purely logical interpretation, which is, for instance, pursued by Ziwa Zhu in Nanjiang and this group, is that it's very difficult to optimize because, you know, it's discrete, it's hard to kind of uh, differentiate, and uh, so you get problems there. Uh, probabilistic uh, has very nice semantics. Uh, people are using uh, arithmetic circuits and knowledge compilation, but inference is typically hard and expensive. And I'll go, go into a bit more details about that later. And then there is the fuzzy, which is um, easy to translate and optimize, but mm -hmm. doesn't have this kind of nice and cool semantics. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it because that's getting a little bit technical. Uh, but if you look at um, the logic uh, as, as constraints, uh, what you will basically get is that uh, probabilities are associated to uh, these facts and these possible walls, but every possible world will get a kind of, of probability. So what's a possible wall? It's just a collection of things that are true, like 
you know, the things that are listed here on the right hand side. And from these probabilities, you can then look at uh, what's the probability that the constraints are satisfied, what's the probability of, uh, of, of a world given the constraints. And then, so you can, can do a lot of stuff. And that's what semantic class is doing and what I'll also be expanding on later. Then there is the logic as kind of soft constraints. Uh, this is uh, very reminiscent of what uh, Markov logic does, uh, the system by Pedro Domingos. And what they do is like, rather than having, you know, the probabilities associated with the facts, uh, they associate it with the rules. And it's not probabilities, it's weight. Um, the idea is that the higher the weight, the stronger the constraint is. So if, um, if you have a wall that doesn't satisfy a constraint, well, the probability of that world decreases as the weight of that, um, that constraint is, is increasing. And in the limit uh, for the weight equal to infinity, it becomes a hard logical constraint. If you violate the hard logical constraint, it's impossible. Uh, that's what uh, Markov logic is doing. And you still get you know, possible walls which are contain things that are true or false. You can go one step further and that's what they do with, for instance, uh, PSL uh, by the group around Liz Gator. Um, and uh, they do something similar as uh, Markov logic. They also associate these weights to the constraints. And again, the higher the weight, the more important it is. But then rather than having possible walls, which are containing facts that are true or false, the facts uh, are becoming, um, yeah, they get a membership degree. They get a kind of degree of being true. This is the fuzzy interpretation. And then they do all kinds of, of things with that. Uh, the cool thing is that it's much faster um, because you get a convex optimization problem. And um, if you use certain uh, yeah, norms, the downside is that uh, logically speaking, uh, it's not the same. And, and certain things that you would expect from a logic to hold like, if A implies B and B implies C, you also expect A implies C to hold. With these fuzzy logics, that's no longer the case. That, can, that kind of thing can be violated. Uh, and so certain intuitions that you have are no longer uh, valid, are no longer guaranteed. That means it's, it's, it's semantically um, not um, the optimal thing to do. Uh, people use it really uh, because it gives them a convenient vehicle to differentiate and, and to optimize. Uh, again, this is what's being used, you know, in logic tensor networks, in semantic based regularization, in this lifted relational neural network. People all use the uh, fuzzy uh, logic. What I'm going to do is rather than resort to this fuzzy interpretation, I'm gonna look at the probabilistic interpretation and uh, I'm gonna illustrate that with uh, our uh, deep uh, problog uh, system. Um, and so in a sense, this uh, deep problog system combines neural networks, probabilistic models and logic uh, in one common um, system, one common representation. And so you can view it as a kind of interface between these three different paradigms, but you should not view it as a pipeline because pipelines, you know, they go in one direction. There's a flow of information from in one direction. In uh, deep problem, the flow is in all kinds of directions. Um, the advantages of uh, deep problem are that it's based on this probabilistic programming language uh, called problog. It's just a simple extension of uh, the prolog programming languages, and then it's extended further with uh, neural networks. As um, compared to other approaches in neurosymbolic, you really get a lot of expressivity. I mean, it's built on top of a programming language, so you get the full expressivity. Uh, but you can also get logic and neural networks as a special case, and you preserve the power of probabilistic programming, and it all has clean and clear uh, semantics. I'm going to illustrate that in two steps. In the first steps, very much as what I did when uh, talking about the different dimensions, I'm going to go from logic to probabilistic logic and then to uh, neural networks uh, using some simple uh, examples. So let's start with the first step. This is the uh, example I was showing about our uh, alarm example, where you have two different proofs. 
the brilliant insight, the seminal idea of Taishiko Sato and uh, David Poole was that in order to unify logic and probability, the thing you need to do is to take the simplest concepts in logic and in probability theory and to unify them. Now, the simplest uh, concept in logic is a propositional variable, and that in um, yeah, probability theory is a random variable. And so propositional variables become random variables. And that provides you with an interface between the logic and the probability. And they then translated that uh, to these uh, probabilistic uh, programs. And essentially, the only change they made is like they uh, associate all of these facts of probability. Uh, they're kind of uh, indicating now this 10% probability that uh, there is a burglary, five that there is an earthquake, uh, and so on. And that's really the only change that uh, you have uh, to make. Uh, given such a program, you can still build proofs uh, as you did before. I mean, I can build proofs for alarm. There's like two possible proofs, one via the first rule for earthquake, one by the other for burglary. And um, it's kind of tempting to say that the probability of one proof is I just take the product along you know, these branches um, along one proof. And so the probability of the first proof is 10%. The probability of the second is 5%. And then it's also tempting to say, well, I'm just going to add the probabilities of these two things. And then I'm going to get the probability of alarm. And that's, of course, a mistake because you can't say that, um, well, if, if you, you take uh, the proofs are like it, it's one or the other, but you should also subtract uh, the, the possibility uh, that both of them are true so that there is both a burglary and an earthquake. And that is actually causing uh, a lot of uh, hard computational problems. It's this what makes uh, the star eye system, this probabilistic programs, uh, computationally uh, hard. Uh, you can also view these as kind of generative models, and that's um, uh, shown in this kind of tree. Um, in this kind of tree, you have like the, the root of the tree, and the root is, is empty. And then every step, we're going to add, you know, some new facts, and we're going to build models, uh, these possible walls that are at the leaves of this tree. And so you start with the empty one. Earthquake is true with probability one. So here you have like earthquake. And then if there is an earthquake, the alarm goes off with probability 60%. So with probability 60%, you have like uh, alarm and earthquake. With probability um, 40%, you have earthquake. And then you kind of recursively, you know, apply these rules. Like um, for instance, uh, in the one where you have earthquake uh, and alarm, while well, you can still like, uh, you know, um, take burglary with probability 5% and 95%, and then you recursively continue until you find uh, the leaves of, of, of that tree. And at the leaves of the tree, you can look at what are the possibilities of my, uh, uh, the, what are the probabilities of my possible world? And so the left one, uh, to get that probability, what you need to do is to multiply uh, all the probabilities that you encountered along that path. So that's like this 0.6 times uh, 0 0.05 times 0 0.8. Uh, that's the probability of the leftmost uh, branch in the uh, tree. And then in order to determine what's the probability of alarm, what you need, need to do, and that's the model theoretic perspective, you would have to sum up uh, all the leaves, uh, all the probabilities of the leaves where alarm is occurring, and that's the orange ones. And so um, that should be indicated here. Now, um, this is um, uh, this probabilistic logic programs. Uh, they correspond very closely uh, to Bayesian networks. And in a sense, you can view them as a much more expressive language to express directed graphical models. I mean, that's why I put this analogy between the two. Um, um, it's just quite quite easy to do that, um, as indicated here. You also see that the facts they correspond to like uh, the roots of the Bayesian networks, those nodes without any parents, and um, so Problog has like um, both these graphical models and uh, you know a programming language as as special cases. 
Now, why are we doing this? Uh, we're doing this to get a lot of added uh, expressive power. And uh, people may be familiar with this kind of plate notation uh, for Bayesian networks. Like here you have like two plates, one for student, one for course. And then there is features, like uh, there is the intelligence of the student, the difficulty of the course, and together they determine the grade that the student will get on the course. Um, it's very easy to map that onto a problock uh, program. It's actually done here. Uh, the only thing that you need to do is for every node in that um, uh, plate, uh, for every uh, entry in the CPT for that node, you'll get like one of these rules. For instance, the red rule says, okay, uh, if the student is intelligent and the course is difficult, so that's like, um, you know, uh, the value of intelligence is, is true, the value of course of difficulty is, is also true, then uh, there is a 30% probability the student will get an A, a 50 that he will get a B, uh, and so on basically. You can then easily vary the number of students, you just add these facts and you'll get uh, as a meaning, what you will get is a kind of network that you see on, on the right hand side where there's a lot of parameter sharing, uh, and where you can really uh, use uh, knowledge that you have about one student to infer something about connected students. Uh, and so the challenge is really in starry eye to kind of compactly learn and, and reason uh, about that. You can uh, go a step further. You can just mix ontological knowledge. You can write down uh, ontologies uh, on top of that and for instance, easily define in logic what it means to be excellent uh, to get uh, satisfactory students um, uh, and so on. It's just using the rules of, of logic, so to say. Uh, inference is the hard part um, in probabilistic logic. So I'm not gonna give a lot of uh, details about it, just a little bit of intuition. This is again, the same program that we had before. It's just written down in uh, problog. Uh, and what you see now is that the bottom rule is mentioning this variable, this x, uh, and x can take two values, Mary and John here. And so in order to compute probabilities, like what's the probability that Mary will call, uh, what you will do is in the first step, you'll kind of remove these variables, you'll ground out everything. So there's two cases, x can be Mary, x can be John. And so that's the rules that you will uh, be getting. Uh, then uh, you'll turn uh, the logic program, you'll rewrite it into something that's logical equivalent, and uh, that's given on, on the right hand side. Um, the details of that are not that important. This is like standard logic and logic programming. Um, and what you then do, and that's the magic step, uh, you'll turn that into an arithmetic circuit. Uh, that's listed uh, on, on the left-hand side. And that's really equivalent. Uh, knowledge compilation is uh, a very important technology. Uh, I mean, people probably have heard of OBDDs. At some point, OBDDs, the paper by Ryan, was like the number one cited paper in computer science. Uh, and that was actually taking, um, you know, these logic, um, logical expressions and turning them into a kind of circuit with particular properties. And that's what this KC is doing. Uh, now, once you have um, the, the circuit, inference is quite easy. You put you know, the probabilities at the, at the leaves of the circuit and you just propagate uh, upwards. Uh, that's what it means to, to do this kind of evaluation. And that makes that this problem of, um, you know, taking the sum of the probabilities of two proofs, that, that problem is solved by the uh, arithmetic uh, circuit. Once you have the circuits, uh, inference is easy. Getting the circuit is a hard and intractable problem uh, in, in, in general. That's why there's a lot of research on that and on various types of, of circuits. Um, there will be further uh, interesting properties of this circuit, namely that you can also do gradient computations on them. And that's, of course, what we're going to need when talking about uh, deep uh, problem. There's a lot of uh, applications of uh, deep problem, like we've done stuff with um, massive multiplayer real-time strategy games, where we try to build models of uh, reasonable environments. 
uh, and the dynamics of this in order to, you know, uh, get a model that would allow us to predict um, what would happen in the future, because if we can predict what's going to happen in the future, what our opponents are going to do, of course, we can take better actions. Uh, it's been used to track people and objects. It's been used to uh, in, in robotics uh, settings, um, where there's also like extensions that are not purely discrete, but work also with continuous distributions uh, and where you can, uh, in a sense, um, you know, first learn the effects of actions uh, in a kind of planning-like representations like PDDL or strips. Uh, and then once you've learned these, um, these um, effects of the action, you can use it uh, for planning. And there's been a series of papers on that. We've used it in uh, computational biology, uh, one in order to find explanations for particular phenomena where you know networks, interaction networks in biology were kind of interpreted in a probabilistic fashion. The kind of links in there were getting probabilities. And then you could look at what's the kind of most relevant network, what are the most relevant passes uh, in these networks. And that was uh, then uh, also some of these systems. Now, if you want to try out uh, Problog, you're very, very welcome. There is a, 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 an easy uh, to access and easy to use um, interface uh, on the web. Uh, just uh, search for Problog uh, and uh, you'll get on, on this page where there's tutorials where you can actually try it out yourself uh, on, in, in, in the web interface and you can get uh, some, some more information. But of course, I'm here to talk about neurosymbolic. So let me now uh, show how um, to extend that. And uh, again, when we were talking about extending problem with neurosymbolic principles, we got back to this lecture from uh, David Poole and Taisuko Sato, like what is the simplest way in which we can now mix neural networks with problem uh, with its probabilistic logics. And uh, we came to the idea of uh, like unifying a neural network and a predicate. And uh, that is providing the interface between uh, the two. Uh, if you do like MNIST classification, you'll get as input uh, an image and as output, you'll get a kind of distribution over the possible uh, numbers. Uh, that are, um, yeah, that, that you can get between zero and nine. And uh, that will be a probability distribution. And uh, so what we did is really we introduced these neural predicates, uh, like you see here, this digit is a neural predicate. It will get as input an MNIST image and as output, it will get, you know, these um, uh, 10 uh, different uh, possible digits. And um, the idea is that the neural network will provide us with, um, um, with the probability uh, that it's, it's one of these uh, possible digits. So the output of the neural network uh, is fixed. It's like this zero to nine, and it's kind of indicates the probability uh, that you can get there. Now, this is a pretty simple concept, but now we can use that to do some uh, powerful things like here, you see, uh, we're looking at this addition predicate, and um, some possible examples for addition are shown on the right. You have like three, five, eight. So two images result, their sum, their addition results in a number, and uh, that is what addition will actually do. Uh, addition is written here uh, as uh, you take the first uh, image um, and you run it through that neural network you get the number back, you take the second, you get the number back. And of course, Z uh, should be the sum of these two numbers. Um, and then what you can, can do is this provides knowledge, right? I mean, you do know that addition satisfies this kind of property. What you don't know is how these numbers, how these uh, images should be classified. That is uh, gonna be learned by your uh, neural networks implicitly. So the examples are at the top layer at the level of addition. You don't provide direct feedback um, about that this first image corresponds to is three. No, you don't do that. The only feedback it gets is uh, through, through the sum. And uh, these are uh, the kind of things you then get. Uh, you can also see why this works. 
uh, it does work because uh, whenever you have like two images, uh, it actually constrains uh, the possible combinations. Like here, if I've got an eight as an output, uh, well, it can be two plus six, it can be four plus four, but it cannot be one plus one because one plus one is not resulting in eight. And so you constrain your possible uh, examples. Uh, you can show that this does better than standard uh, convolutional neural networks. No surprise, there is more knowledge. Um, uh, and um, you could say, well, what's all the fuss about? Um, well, there's more fuss because it's very easy to write more complicated programs, like to you know take uh, lists of such MNIST images, like the ones that you have here, and then uh, kind of uh, train at, at the same in the same way. Uh, the only thing you need to do is slightly change your uh, uh, prolog program. Again, there is only one unknown neural predicate, this digit. And uh, you can see that, you know, uh, it trains perfectly or almost perfectly on um, MNIST uh, lists of images uh, like what you, you get here. Uh, as I said, um, inference is um, um, kind of going through the circuits. And so the basic inference mechanism of problog is retained. The only thing that changes is that some of these leaves, they are neural predicates now. And uh, these neural predicates, well, there's a neural network underneath. And then um, as these circuits are differentiable, you really start at the top level and you push down the loss uh, first from through the circuit to the leaves and then from the leaves into the parameters of your uh, neural network. And there's a lot more to say about it. Like there's some elegant um, principles underlying that um, connected to semi rings and stuff like that, but I'm not gonna say much more about this. Uh, what can you do with this? Well, uh, we did some experiments uh, comparing with uh, differentiable force to learn like uh, programs. Um, essentially, you wanted to learn certain aspects of, of partial programs. Like if you have a sort, uh, uh, if you want to sort and you don't know um, whether, you know, this image is smaller than that other image, you can, um, if you don't know less than, so to say, you can, can try to learn that um, using these neural uh, predicates. Um, and that's uh, this kind of whole predicate that, that's indicated here. And then we did better than uh, the state of the art uh, back then. Um, you can do uh, addition with uh, two numbers and, and the carry. You can do some word algebra problems. Uh, and we compare it with uh, these other systems by uh, the group around uh, Riedel, uh, Sebastian Riedel. Um, you can also still do the kind of things that uh, graphical models give you, that probabilistic models give you, and that's indicated here. Here you've got a noisy version of the addition, and there is this uh, parameter uh, noisy that says, um, well, with a particular probability, you're gonna give something random. Uh, in the other case, you're gonna do the, the addition that we, we did before, and uh, by training this, um, you can actually recover um, uh, the noise level and, and uh, uh, you see that um, uh, the problem does better here uh, when the, the, the noise parameter is, is explicitly listed. You can uh, carry it over to um, some domains where there is real probability involved, like uh, if you have cards and you wanna know what's the probability that you win a particular game with partial observability, you can again, uh, you know, uh, use that to, to learn since. Uh, I'm gonna skip that part. You can simulate uh, what the neural theorem pro prover does uh, because you can, in a sense, build in the soft unification uh, inside uh, Problog. It's quite easy uh, to do that, but in the interest of time, I think I probably uh, should skip that. Uh, it works through uh, modeling embeddings and explicitly mani manipulating embeddings using the interface that the problog gives you, uh, the embeddings coming from the neural networks and the manipulation on the vectors uh, are then done in the uh, logic, uh, so to say. And you can, you can, you can do uh, interesting things uh, there. Um, let me maybe 
conclude by saying that um, we also have a sister system uh, called Deep Stocklog. And that's uh, based on kind of, um, you know, logic programming uh, based uh, uh, probabilistic grammars um, where you get a, a slightly different uh, semantics, but where you can do things uh, a bit faster than you do in, 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 in the prob log. It also has, has a different uh, meaning. So uh, this is this probabilistic uh, definite clause grammars, uh, so to say. Uh, but maybe I should leave some time for questions. Uh, there's many challenges that remain in, um, I think, neurosymbolic. A first one is really to scale up, uh, to scale up while keeping uh, the right kind of semantics. There's approximate and algorithms that we have developed. Uh, another one is like to go more real life applications. So far, there's relatively few of these real life applications. Uh, and then there's of course like dealing with uh, the yeah, idiosyncrasies of, of neural networks sometimes. Like I showed like two plus three is, is eight. We have two MNIST images, one number. Um, if you train um, with the standard loss functions uh, with just images, you'll get uh, that it always translate zero plus zero uh, becomes zero. And in the sense that makes sense because it's the simplest thing uh, that you can do. I would say this is a, an excellent area for starting researchers. Uh, we actually have PhD positions and postdoc positions uh, available in that area. So if people are interested, uh, please uh, do contact me. And uh, let me remind you of the, the key messages. There's a lot of uh, similarities between STARI and between neurosymbolic and um, both at the level of problems and at the level of solutions. And then um, I also like this kind of uh, perspective where you really uh, get the originals back as a specialty. If you mix two things, you don't want that one takes over and the rest is kind of diminished. You basically want the power uh, of, of the two. Uh, so thanks for uh, listening. Thank you very much, Luke. It's really, uh, it was a fascinating talk about merging three different topics. Um, uh, are there questions, please? Don't raise your hand, just voice up your question. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, very nice presentation, look, and the over uh, uh, If I understand correctly, uh, at the very basis of your logic programming uh, uh, approach, uh, you have the distribution semantics. Have you considered an extension of the answer of the stable model semantics or answer set programming? Yes, um, in the probabilistic logics, um, that has been done, but not yet in the neurosymbolic. I know that there is like a system called Neurasp um, that is uh, doing similar things as as the problog, but within the ASP uh, framework. Uh, so that has been done. But I'm not sure that at the semantic level, uh, this is, is kind of equivalent uh, to the stable model. Uh, um, yeah, to the stable model ones. Uh, because also like from a semantic perspective, it gives similar ideas, but then there is the idea that you also condition on the images that you have or the inputs that you have. So there is some kind of complexity uh, that is not entirely captured or fully understood yet, I would say. Excellent. Another question, please. Uh, yeah, I have a question and thanks for nice presentation. And you showed that decision making uh, presentation where there are calls uh, standing at the intersection and they have to decide what they have to do. So in case of deep prologue, how it can be applied in those kind of situations which are very complex and where uh, conflict and all those things happens based on the intention of the driver. So how do you think that deep prologue or this kind of model can be employed in the intersection like scenario? Because rules are very fuzzy in nature, traffic rules, if I assume, they are very fuzzy and uh, to model them is also another complexity in this case. Yes, uh, at this stage, I think nobody really knows how to do that, but I think it's something that one probably should work towards. And you could well imagine um, something like uh, giving constraints that if, um, you know, 
there is a red light in front of you, you shouldn't drive on. I mean, this is something you can actually um, give as a constraint to rather than, than trying to learn that, uh, so to say. Um, because learning that you would never, well, you would probably have very few cases where people drive on when there is um, uh, a red light in front of them. Um, but yeah, where would that data come from, so to say? It, it, it's very, very hard to, to do, I think. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, like using logics um, to kind of guide uh, all of this uh, is promising. How to do it, I think, um, well, probably people uh, that are working on this uh, from an application perspective may have some ideas, but um, I think it's too early in any case uh, to expect the neurosymbolic systems to, to treat all of that uh, right now. But that would be the $1 million, well, probably the multi-million dollar uh, kind of, of solution, right, or problem. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, thanks for your answer. Yeah, that's quite interesting because perception things are completely the sub symbolic, but yeah, when decision making comes into picture at that time, because I think that the problem can be really be used in that case. Thanks for your answer. Uh, by the way, we are very interested in those uh, one million dollar questions in this million dollar workshop. So, if any of you wants to, to to discuss these topics, that would be fine, because this topic is really very it poses a lot of scientific challenges. So if in a sense we try to replicate Hilbert's uh, challenges that fueled mathematics for an entire century, then we can try to do it once more. And Luke or anybody else are welcome to define those uh, types of challenges and debate on them, smaller or bigger ones. So any other question? Yes, I have one question. Uh, would it be possible to learn on the fly with your approach? So, for example, to, to add one more rule, one constraint um, on the fly if the system is already running? Um, I think that could be possible. Yes, I, I think that that would be possible. Like, uh, you probably have to recompile your circuits and, and, and do things like that. But I think that's, um, that, that can be done, I think, yes. Uh, Okay, and one more question on the uh, example you showed the, the, the multiplayer um, strategy game. So did did the proper win, was it? Well, it was not about winning, it was about learning a model that would allow you to predict something. And it was able to uh, predict, uh, yeah, with, with some kind of, of reasonable accuracy, like uh, what can be expected. Uh, it's a dynamic model that you can use to look ahead a couple of steps with reasonable okay. predictions. Like, will this city be conquered or not? Will it be attacked or not? Uh, this, this kind of stuff. Okay, so it didn't really play in the game. It didn't really play. No, no, yeah, no. It, it didn't really try play. Try to learn the model. Okay. Yes, yes. Of course, you could turn it into kind of reinforcement learning setting and, and do that. But yeah, I think that would be even harder. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Uh, yes, I have one. So, uh, uh, look, I'm I'm working with uh, Sebastian Domacic. I'm his uh, PhD student at TU okay. Delft. And uh, something that we've been discussing is uh, the fact that uh, the prologue is not uh, fully declarative, unlike, for instance, prologue. And one of the alleys that we wanted to go uh, to maybe make it declarative in the example with uh, MNIST uh, digits is to incorporate uh, variational autoencoders into the system. Uh, did you at all uh, think about the declarative nature of the problem? Is there anything uh, you could maybe uh, add here? Um... Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean with the declarative nature now, like, because that's... Um, uh, uh, okay, so um, uh, on an example, so you have two digits of, uh, two images of digits, and you get a number. Right. We basically want to go the other way around. <laughs> so oh, that, yes. Yeah, so that we can generate a digit, uh, an image of a digit, sorry. There was a master's thesis uh, around these issues. Uh, I think there's also a paper on archive by some of our people uh, like Giuseppe Mara, Emmanuel Sansoni, 
uh, there is a paper about that. Uh, if, if you send me an email, I can, can probably find it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? I have more of a comment rather than a question. Uh, you know, I'm more in the machine learning side, and one of the problems um, we try to investigate is how to quantify knowledge. We, we all talk about knowledge, but when especially comes to DNA, so well, what is the knowledge and was the quote quantity of knowledge stored in a network, and uh, what is forgetting and what is learning. So these are really open issues from what we have seen in the literature. Is this the same situation in symbolic AI and also in the confluence of those two areas? Um, well, I guess knowledge is, is, well, if you want to quantify it, it's of course um, um, hard, but you could probably use some measures, but but I think it's even harder with neural networks because like a neural network is a black box, right? There's nothing, yeah. there's a lot of knowledge in there, but you don't know what it is exactly. At least with the probabilistic logics, you do know what's inside because you can interpret it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can reason about it. Uh, you can connect it to, to other parts. So you get in a sense, this explainability um, for free, so to say. Uh, but I think, yeah, with the neural networks and black boxes, it's it's a lot harder, right? Uh, so, so you mean in the case of symbolic AI, basically, if you want to quantify knowledge, you start uh, counting your statements or counting the complexity of your trees, and that's it? Um, well, you at least know what knowledge is, in a sense, right? Like, how what, what is the knowledge in neural network? Okay, you've got a function, a black box. Okay, I don't know. How would you quantify that? How do you? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what we would like to investigate. So, if anybody, including you, Luke, if you are interested in this topic, right. then we can discuss it. Uh, yeah. It's it's a very interesting topic for us. Yes, that's uh, that's maybe one of these uh, Hilbert questions, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> definitely. Okay, is there any other question? Yes, so uh, one question. Uh, it seems like deep problem is mostly an interface between a black box and a probabilistic logic program. So it doesn't seem to help much to explain the reasoning inside the neural net, or am I? No, it doesn't explain what's in the neural network, but what it does do is it allows you to manipulate certain things like these embeddings. I didn't talk about that. Uh, these can be manipulated in the logic and you, you can reason about these. Uh, like one of the examples we had is like, um, um, I can probably find, sketch it like here. Um, like here where you, you kind of define uh, a successor predicate. And so for instance, three, five, okay, there's two numbers in between them and you can kind of embed these MNIST images and you can embed like, you know, the successor vector. And then what you see at the bottom of these rules is like, okay, by doing certain operations like multiplication addition and stuff like that uh you you know you can you can look at um how close it's, it's gonna be uh and that's like implementing a little bit like yeah the idea of of, of these things like trans e and and, and and others so that uh and, and you can see that it works like the embeddings of the numbers are are, are indicated here uh, and you see on the right it's kind of left is before training right is after training you see it's kind of does make sense. Um, so, so you get some some kind of constraints again, and you know, this makes sense. You you can try to interpret it. I think it's harder to do with. Well, I, I'm not sure. I am not sure how you would do that. Um, how you would interpret that otherwise? But. Okay, so you can use probabilistic logic to kind of combine uh, different. Uh, input output from different neural nets to try to make sense of of the global yes. representation yes you you can do some of that we haven't gone very far i mean this is all uh in, in the research phase um but yeah that that's that's the hope that this will allow you to do that and, and this is like one example that indicates it, it might be possible okay thank you very much well uh, and then, yes please 
Yes, I, I had one uh, small question, if I may. Sure. Uh, from a software engineering aspect, uh, I am wondering, uh, for example, how you would go uh, uh, about, for example, debugging these sorts of programs and the interactions, because it's it's a very complex thing to to mix logic and neural networks, and then uh, how do you even quantify correctness? Because there's the it's already a fuzzy notion even in logic programming and even here, I don't know how you would even attack this. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, well, I guess debugging would still work uh, on this. You could like, well, in, in principle, although that would mean you change the execution model. So, so, so yeah, I, I guess that's again another hard question. Um, but, you can get explanations, you can get like these proofs. You could, in a sense, almost try to run a debugger, uh, although this would be challenging tasks in, 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 in themselves, so to say. But yeah, that's not, not um, of course, what you want as a software engineer. As a software engineer, you would want to have something better than, than, than this. So another open question. I mean, there's okay. a lot of good open questions in this domain. Uh, it's an ideal topic for uh, PhD students and uh, research today. Um, it's only going to grow in, in in importance. I think this neurosymbolic. It's it's yeah, uh, not necessarily our approaches, but you know the whole field is 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 getting a lot of attraction. Okay, thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to wrap up this discussion. It was an excellent talk and a very good discussion at the very end. I would like to thank you very much for your excellent talk and all of you for participating. Um, and uh, we have another lecture in uh, two weeks from now that's uh, on uh, robotic learning. So you're welcome to, to attend it as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.